everybody. I'm glad that uh, we are all uh, signed up and uh, ready to listen to this uh, lecture. I welcome everybody onto this lecture on uh, COVID-19, uh, an enigma. I call it an enigma because uh, the way this virus has uh, been uh, teaching us things is quite very unique. And uh, that's the reason I call it an, I'm naming this uh, presentation as an enigma. Uh, I'm Dr. Manish Paul, I'm the director of uh, R&D uh, for research and management at uh, Acharya Group of Institutions, uh, which is in Bangalore. And the presentation uh, is made uh, in such a way that mix of balance of between scientifically quite deep people are also there in the participants and also who are uh, very superficial as well. So I try to strike a balance between both the audience. And one uh, of the Cautionary note is even the best existing research and data will be considered to undergo revision as the pandemic progresses, because our perspective has changed over a period of time since the time the uh, pandemic started. So I keep this statement to make sure that we all understand that what I say today is good as of today, but it could change as we progress forward. Now, diving into the main topic, uh, this is the beautiful world of microbes I'd like to introduce to you to understand where we are and what this virus is. Because many a times when you look at the television, the image what we get is it's a huge virus like a football and we can catch it and the dramatization of the news media makes us think that it is a, we can see it with the naked eyes, but that is not true. So if you look at the scale, 0.2 micrometers is the scale of a bacteria, which is a spherical in shape, which is called as cocci. Bacilli is one which is rod shaped and we have got comma shaped which causes the cholera and then we have a uh, cocco bacilli which is neither rod shaped nor uh, oval it is like it, it's little oval shape and spiral shaped bacteria from bacteria when you move further on we see the fungi fungi are also microorganisms all these images what i'm showing can be seen not with your naked eyes but only under the microscope so this these are microscopic images of fungi what you're seeing in the left lower quadrant and then what we see here are the viral structures if you look at both sides we see that uh, the bacteria and uh, fungi on the next one which is the parasites have got very diffuse shape I mean, they need not be a specific shape they can change they can flexibility is there unlike the viruses which are very defined they're symmetrical uh, the reason is viruses are different than any other living organisms. We don't call them organisms. This is the picture which shows you uh, how the bacteria multiplies. And then once it multiplies like this, every 20 minutes, what you see is a colony. Now this picture is not a, uh, anything which is made by hand. This is how the, a mold has grown. It is like a, like a volcano. And what you see, the white drops around are the spores which the, fun, uh, the mold has produced. And look at the beautiful way the mold has grown on its own. This is the beauty which was invisible to the naked eye. But when you give the proper food to it in a beaker, it grows into a lovely design. And there are some molds. Now, this is a mold. It begins as an invisible cell and forms such a beautiful colony. Right? This is a colony. This is what we can see and isolate. And when you look at the bacteria, this is the bacterial colony called a pseudomonas, which produces. Uh, you know, a lovely, shiny, wet colony. From this, we take the colony and do the further studies. This is fundamentals of microbiology, yeah? Moving on to pandemic, what you see here is a Petri dish. It's a plate, a spherical shaped glass plate in which we have put a particular food for the bacteria. And an artist has inoculated the bacteria in such a way that the next day it looks like the, a complete world map. This is a beautiful art and a lot of uh, hand uh, skill is required in this, the design, what they have done. So differences between an endemic, an epidemic, and a pandemic. An endemic disease is always present in a particular place or a community, while an epidemic is little widespread. And uh, usually there are a large number of people who would experience it an infection. And uh, usually part of a country or a region is what an epidemic is going to be. The pandemic, which is a rare thing which happens, which right now we are going through that, is when the disease spreads across the boundaries. 
So microbes knows no boundaries. They can go anywhere in the world. Uh, we have drawn the boundaries to say that this is India, this is uh, Pakistan, this is America, this is China, but bacteria knows the microorganisms do not know anything. So they can go anywhere. And they are usually, pandemics ca are caused by a novel organisms. Generally, they're viral in nature. And uh, they, they become pandemic because there is, the immune system has no idea about this kind of an infection. Right, this kind of organism. So that's the reason it spreads very fast until the human body studies this organism and produces a defense system against it. So that's why the death rate is generally higher during a pandemic compared to an uh, epidemic or an endemic. Then coming to the antibody resistance, that is another thing which is a secondary effects which starts happening due to the pandemic. Now, what are the factors which uh, contribute for the emergence or re-emergence of uh, infectious diseases? Today's global world of trans, uh, you know, uh, what we do. We travel around the world, right? And we see what uh, the whole world is uh, there and we go on tourism and things like that. We are constantly on the move, right? So that is the reason we have this challenge of uh, spreading the bacteria very fast all around. Now, this is, there is one point I just skipped. This is the bio-warfare or bioterrorism. of course. Today's world, a lot of people say this is a man-made virus created by China or some other country. They are spreading all around the world. Well, these are all hypotheses or conspiracy theories at this point in time, because as a scientist, unless there is evidence, we cannot say it is man-made because viruses have got a natural tendency to mutate and jump from species to species and spread. There is nothing new about it. So we believe this could be a natural uh, transmission is what I believe at this point in time. And people blame the World Health Organization stating that it is it was not doing a good job, but they have followed a protocol. The WHO, the first three phases of the disease when it is predominantly either animal-based or there are very few human infections, there is uncertainty. Whether it could be just an endemic or an epidemic, we do not know, we are still studying it. And when it starts moving between human to human in a sustained manner, which is phase four, is when we think, okay, there are higher chances of it becoming a pandemic. And then it jumps into phases five to six onwards, it is a pandemic season. And we are into the pandemic, ongoing pandemic stage right now. Introducing you, n sars -CoV now it's a novel severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus two. And these viruses are not new to us, they're very old. We know them for a very long time. This image is a very old image. And recently, just two days ago, there was an image in Australia, a lovely image of the new coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2, is, this is how they look. And what you see here is it is entered into a cell. This is the outside, this is the inside, a human cell is what it is entered. And CDC's artistic representation is, this is how it looks. It looks very colorful. Of course, you do not know its color because in a lot, we, we can only see them in electron microscopy, which is, uh, you know, monochromatic. Just an idea about the sizes. Look at if one meter, the viruses are measured in one billionth size of a meter. That is the size which is invisible. It is so invisible, you cannot make out that it is there. And there is a major difference between a bacteria and a virus. For example, bacteria are larger, they're like thousand nanometers or one micrometer is what we call them, sizes. But viruses are still measured in nanometer scale. And cellular functions are all normally present in bacteria. They're living, they can feel, they can move on their own, and they do a lot of activity. They don't need anything to survive. Unlike viruses, which require a living cell where they can enter inside and they live. So we call them living entities. In the sense, there is nothing but a protein cap. I'll show you in the next slide. Uh, it is. It can live on a surface for a very long time without any wet matter. But bacteria needs some moisture to survive. Otherwise, just to form a spore and then live in that. Otherwise, bacteria needs a living system to survive. The environment. But viruses, they need a living cell only. Only then it can start to multiply and start growing. So that is a major difference between uh, these two organisms. So look at this. This is a viral. It's a cross-section artist. Uh, I mean, especially this company, Nucleus Medical Media, has drawn this on beautiful pictures. Uh, these, are the, these are the screen graphs of a video. Uh, you see the nuclear material, which is inside. 
and that is covered by a protein shell and that is covered by an envelope. And this envelope is studded with protein spikes. This is how a virus is organized. This is all. There is no cellular, there is no cytoplasm, there is no nucleus, you call you cannot call it a nucleus because there is no defined nucleus and there is nothing mitochondria. None of the cell organelles are existing in this uh, cell, in this virus. And when it, to see where it causes infection, I put the picture of lung here. Lung, if you look at, it is begins with the trachea. A trachea goes and divides it into bronchi, two big bronchi. Bronchi becomes bronchioles. These are the smaller branches of the bronchi, which are called bronchioles. The bronchioles will end up into alveoli. This is the site of action where the capillaries surround them throughout and then do the gas exchange, carbon dioxide and oxygen exchange happens at this surface. So alveoli in along with the capillaries where the our breathing helps in exchanging the gases. It gives out oxygen and takes away carbon dioxide from the system. This is what is happening. And now when a viral cell comes, it attaches to the human cell. These are called receptors. I'll show you another picture. Now here is a receptor to which a coronavirus is attaching here. And then it gets engulfed through, a, this is inside the cell now. It has come in an endosome. So it is carried in that endosome towards the nucleus. And in the nucleus, it comes in. And then it starts replicating its nuclear material through a ribosome, which is the protein making machinery. It is a factory where nucleus is multiplied. I mean, the nuclear material is translated into proteins. Okay, so that's where uh, it starts functioning. Then it forms on the cell. This is one cell. This is one alveolar cell we're talking about, uh, epithelial cells. This is where the it starts forming the studs on the top and then starts coming out a new virus is born. So one virus gives birth to several millions of viral particles. And these now causes inflammation of the alveoli. Okay, when the inflammation happens, it starts producing a protein liquid. And that is when the problem begins. So look at this. The, uh, there is clean alveoli, proper action, carbon dioxide, oxygen exchange is happening. But when it starts in the moderate level, there is proteinaceous fluid starts filling in. And in severe cases, it is totally filled. That's when breathlessness begins. The oxygen support is required. So many actions will begin to happen now. And that leads to either lobar pneumonia or you know, bronchopneumonia. Now, we believed all this time it causes only lung infection, but it is not so true. It also causes other infections, other organ infections. Look at this. It, in, it infects the brain. Right? It is not only symptomatic, it is, there are papers <clears throat> which talk about it crossing the blood-brain barrier and causing you know, central, nerve, central systems infections, and that is very dangerous. Even though we support the lungs, if it attacks the brains, then our ventilator doesn't function anymore. So it is very important to control the disease in the early stage of the disease itself. So brain, it can cause the eye infections, it can cause the nose infections, even Indian scientists in IIT have reported this one recently. Then it can cause cardiac infections because that is where the, you know, predominantly we've got the ACE inhibitors as well there, ACE uh, receptors. Then it can cause the liver infections. That could be due to an immune system overdrive because the whole body is functioning. Liver is the major factory where everything is broken down and analyzed and sent into its different directions. So if that gets affected, the whole body undergoes a lot of trauma. And when this is done, it has to excrete it, and that is kidney. And if kidney gets affected, then of course, it is like stopping the tap, and things start going very bad. The body becomes septic, and things become pretty worse. And it is also known that it causes intestinal infections. Okay? So that's why uh, I think in Bangalore as well, uh, people are searching in sanit uh, you know, sanitary water, sewage water, for uh, whether there is presence of this virus. They are doing these investigations. Now, what is the difference between COVID-19, that is coronavirus disease 19, and the common flu? The infectivity rate is higher and the immunogenicity, the ability to induce an immune response in the host. These are some of the traits of the virus required, which means the body has to be strong enough <clears throat> to fight this infection. If we are weaker or if we have some other conditions within us, then it becomes very difficult for it to survive. So now you have here 
either the immunogenicity of the virus or the infective ability of the virus. And also there is pathogenicity, which means how deep can it this, uh, engage the whole cell for itself and make the cell, the body to work for itself rather than uh, allowing the body to fight it. So it can easily manage, manipulate the whole system, genetic system into the cells and say that I am the boss, you listen to me now and the body starts, those cells starts responding to it. And of course, a lot of chemical reactions happen. I'm not going to go into that. It is called, as you must have heard, in the cytokine uh, storm. Uh, these are all the complexities which start building up uh, in making the disease much more complex to treat. So what are the common symptoms and differentiation between COVID-19, flu, and common cold? If you notice, one of the cardinal features is mainly breathlessness, is what one you experience for most of the cases. Otherwise, most of the symptoms overlap with flu or some of them with common cold as well. We have dry cough, we got fever, but there is no running nose. And we've got sore throat, breathlessness, headache, body aches, sometimes sneezing, of course, it's not always, uh, it's a rarity. Fatigue, of course, most of the patients have. And rare cases, we do have people having the GI symptoms as well, that is the diarrhea. Okay, all right, moving on. Uh, now, this is as per CDC. Earlier, they, they had said only three things, fever, cough, shortness of breath. But now, today, the, the website talks about chills, repeated shaking with chills, muscle pain, headache, sore throat, new loss of taste or smell. These are the things, are the common features for COVID-19. And in case you have trouble breathing or chest pain or pressure in the chest or new kind of confusion or bluishness of your lips or face, then immediately the patient has to be taken to a hospital. Otherwise, when the symptoms may start to show, you can still stay at home until shortness of breath starts uh, getting initiated. And that's the time you go to the hospital where dangerous for high-risk individuals, of course, but secondary infections can also happen there. So the mild form is gone and it gets into a moderate to severe form. And then the patient goes into a critical phase. That is when the hospital-based systems patient can be managed, not at home. The moment you start feeling any shortness of breath, please rush to a hospital. Now, where does this uh, coronavirus stay? We say, eh, nothing happens. No, it happens because these viruses can stay on inanimate objects for a very long period of time. Plastics, five days, paper, four to five days. I'm not talking about newspapers here. Don't worry about the newspaper so much. The glasses, when you're moving in and out, the doorways, the staircase, the wood, the, the taps, the I know, surgical gloves, it stays there. And another thing, somebody was asking this question and I found a publication on in this regard is, uh, when you go for walks, what happens? When a person sneezes, now this sneeze is in a mucus particle, which is containing these viral particles and they are transmitted. Now look at this picture. When a person sneezes, if you're going in the line of the person walking, uh, this is a lovely paper I give the uh, reference here. Uh, this it causes the person right behind them to contract, or at least take the virus on themselves. Now look at this image from top and sideways. How much of when a person, if they're running, it is almost 20 meters is where you can get those particles flying because it also depends upon the wind speed which is coming. So always better to go with the wind rather than go against the wind because. If you're going against the wind, somebody behind you may get, if, if one person is sick, right? So please take precautions about this when you're going out for a walk and things like that. Always better to have a zigzag with a, a gap between the two of them of more than one, week, one meter. So that's when uh, social distancing comes into picture. In case if we do not maintain social distancing, what happens? One person infects 2.5 persons and by day five, and within 30 days, more than 400 people get infected. Now to control this, we put social distancing. When you have moderate distancing, then we can bring down to 15 people, which is what we are doing right now. The number of people you have reduced in India who get infected. But if you are much stricter, then it is hardly two and a half people per month, right? From one infected person, so less people get infected. So social distancing is very important. Now if you don't, now one person gets positive. Look at the burden on the whole system. Now that person has to be quarantined and monitored you know, in isolation and look for symptoms. And if there are symptoms, then we put them into the hospital, then keep testing them and manage the patient and try to save the patient. And we will, our aim is to save the patients. And if they have 
other contacts, all their contacts have to be again quarantined. So it's a massive exercise. So if you quarantine yourself, then you reduce the burden on the whole system. That is what you're doing a favor to the, uh, the society and to the healthcare professionals uh, functioning. So to achieve these goals, lockdown parameter uh, lockdown was implemented. Some of the parameters which were calculated used were incubation period was three years. That's a normal thing. 85% infected population will have no or mild symptoms. Then hospital rate of 6% if you have in line with age distribution of India's population. I'll show you about that. Then this helps us what we have done so far, right? Because asymptomatic clearance period is about three days. It can go up to 28 days, of course, but most of the cases or asymptomatic will take about five days to get cleared the virus from their body. Now, this is the data from the WHO. As of today, we have got about 63,861 new cases and we have crossed 8 million already around the world, right? And death rate is also not an easy number what you're looking at. As of today, we have got quite a few deaths, right? We've got, this is something alarming. We don't want to have so many deaths. But, but of course, when you look at globally every year by year, other diseases are taking death toll without distancing. But with distancing, when the death toll increases, it is something a matter of concern. The Indian data is taken in the evening. And if you look at today, in the evening, we have about 33,362 confirmed cases and death is at 1082. The numbers are not so high in India, which is a good thing for us, right? Uh, there are several attributes given to this, why? But uh, I'll not go into that. But we see there has been a consistent rise. If you look at this uh, graph, uh, uh, it is logarithmic graph. It's a, it's a log scale, it's not a linear scale. So you see the jump quite well uh, jumping up. So at the same time, look at the recovery. Recovery is also jumping up quite well, right? So there is hope. So how do we do it? So we, we, you must have heard this word, flattening the curve. That is done by social distancing. What, what is flattening the curve? When you do not control the infection, transmission, then we have such high number of people who are sick, right? And what you see this dashed line here is our capacity of the healthcare system to manage the cases. So to slow down the number of people whom the healthcare system can manage, we put a lockdown. Right? So the number of cases are low. In the meantime, it can also help if, from the asymptomatic people to spread the quote unquote herd immunity. But the purpose is mainly the, uh, it is directly proportional to the capacity of our healthcare system. If you had a higher healthcare system, maybe we'll have a little moderate level. Otherwise we should have a very strict level of uh, self-isolation. Now this is a lovely graph, uh, which is uh, uh, until last night it is taken. London time, 11.30 a.m. So you look at how the flattening is happening. I will highlight some of the countries. Let us look at Japan, South Korea, China, Italy, Spain, this is US, red line. Many countries have started bending the curve and are flattening. It is not going up. They're all coming down, which means there is certain amount of control. This is based on data and not prediction. Right? There is some tool going around in the uh, internet. That tool will predict and it says, by end of uh, May, the whole world will be clean of the virus. And uh, in India, it is going to be mid-May, it is going to be thoroughly clear around 20th or something. But you know what? There's a predictions based on um, algorithms. They are there to help us, but we should take the message from it and make our own thought and really database decisions. Death is for truth. So I have taken the death rate here. Because death is because testing, unless you're tested everybody, you cannot say the number is going up or down. So death is for truth, because all these patients have gone to the hospital and taken. United States has come down comparatively as of today. And if you look at Spain, there was a spike in China in between recently, but again, it has come back to normalcy. India is here, the orange color one a line. It is, we have very low death rate in India compared to other countries, which is a good thing. Let us continue to do that, save more people in our country. Now, the basis of this is vulnerability of the population. Now, if you look at the world population, and I'm looking at the Indian population now, out of this, uh, the birth to date and births today versus deaths to date and death today. So we are looking at 20,000 deaths today, but overall due to COVID, we have about 1,080, uh, right? We have about 1,080 is the death, uh, 1082. That is the death rate we are looking at. So the number of death rates versus 
the number of deaths naturally happening in the country are quite different. Uh, to date, we have got 30, uh, 3 lakhs 40,000 people who have died in our country altogether. But due to COVID, it's about 1,000 people. Yeah? Look at the reasons could be, uh, Germany, US, Italy, and India have compared here. The percentage of old population is 5.5%. More than 64 years are only 5.5% in India compared to other countries where there are higher numbers. Now, to add to this age factor, which is large, there is also the comorbidities which can come into picture. This is from a recent study in uh, JAMA, uh, Journal of uh, American Medical Association publication, which talks about hypertension cases were about 56% and CAD were 11.1. Now, among these, there are comorbidities, means additional health problems in them are diabetes or obesity. Now, they complicate the treatment process because the drugs used for managing them and the way the disease is managed is very different for each condition. Now, when you bring in the COVID into the system, I showed you the way it starts damaging multiple organs. Now, how do we manage which system? So that's when mortality starts increasing. So when you have older population who are already slow in their process of recovery for, for any condition for that matter, and if they have these conditions additionally with them, over and above that, if they get an infection of a virus, which can go everywhere having a gala time, then there's a challenge. So death rates increase. So when people ask why death rates are higher in other countries, this is one of the potential reasons, all right? There are a lot of youngsters also dying. Now switching gears towards the treatment. Now look at drug discovery machinery. For a drug to be discovered, this is a long process. A thousands of molecules get synthesized, designed and screened and only one molecule, the lucky guy goes through the funnel. And once it goes to the funnel, he has this particular molecule has to go through several stages of clinical trials. The first phase of the clinical trial here, what you see, checking for safety means we just want to check whether the drug is safe on anybody. So it's a healthy people who are tested upon, not the patients. Then we take a small group of patients having the condition and test them in that is called phase two. And if it is successful there, then it go to phase three, where we have a large number of population whom we test the molecule for efficacy means whether it is curing them or not. If it cures, then it come, becomes a drop into the market, all right? But at this point in time, we are not only looking at these antiviral drugs because we have to look at managing the physical damages the virus has done to the body as well, right? It is not only killing the virus is not the only goal. Of course, we are trying to find medicine to kill the virus, but what to do with what is happening with other parts of the body, right? So now to increase the speed, this is the first time scientists are in a race with time, right? So we have to quickly do things. So what has happened is we've taken the past molecules, which have been proved, approved, okay? And we have repurposed them. We call them repurposing of the molecule. So there are known ant uh, antiviral agents. Right now, see there are, to treat symptoms, we have got 18 molecules in trials. And to reduce the inflammation of the body, we have got 26 molecules. To stop the viral growth, we are having 21 molecules in the trials. And to prevent them, we are testing two molecules. Right? And several, about 30 plus molecules are in the trial one, wherein they're still in the lab making these molecules, right? But these are some of the data from the clinical trials. If you see chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine, this uh, uh, has lost its game. It has failed in most of the uh, trials, right? The one which is uh, showing a lot of promise is the, uh, the, the Remdesivir by Gilead, and that is doing a quite good job. And we had data even yesterday and showing a lot of promise. So hope that would be able to, you know, bring in some respite to the whole uh, handling of this viral infections rather than the disease per se. So yeah, the same thing what I mentioned. We are going to look at anti-inflammatories, anticoagulants, and we need to look at every aspect, including, including the drug-drug interaction of the new drugs we are going to use. Coming to the vaccines, there are more than 30, uh, 60 vaccines in the preclinical, in the laboratory level, and we have got one which has come to uh, phase three now, and other one is in between phase one and three. But, I mean, two and three. Now the beauty is here, there is one of the molecule, okay, uh, for the vaccines, what we do is we have to make vaccines against a live virus of a different species, like pox. You know, they use a cowpox virus, right? 
so the you can give immunity with a related virus so that is a live virus live attenuated is you can look at these spikes the color difference the difference in that we have taken off certain major parts of the virus which are dangerous or in which can cause more harm and but it should be able to generate the antibodies which are here the y shape or some we totally inactivate them and these are the three ways how we raise the antibodies or uh, for treating the patients either giving them or raising the antibodies and giving the antibodies itself other are the dna rna vaccines which are genetically we synthesized and they're produced in the laboratory proteins and then we start producing the antibodies in the trial are quite a few and i'll draw your highlight towards this uh, charox which is uh, from the university of oxford uh, in fact serum institute is already manufacturing it with the hope that this is going to be successful so that is the faith we have so still we are looking at another uh, 6 to 8 months before we get a vaccine into the system because now there is no option we are talking of herd immunity the reason we talk of herd immunity is there is no choice it is not an option if i have a vaccine versus herd immunity obviously i'll jump towards a vaccine right so that i can protect the more population now we don't have a vaccine we don't have a drug to treat the patient so what do we do we depend upon an obvious that is the herd immunity and in the herd immunity what happens is more people get infected and most of them would have subclinical infection but we produce antibodies so the virus when it comes again to the communities it doesn't have place not many people are available for it to infect so that's how it slowly starts disappearing from the system so that is called herd immunity which comes naturally but now we are looking at induced that is through a vaccine right coming to diagnostics everybody is talking about testing 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 i am not a great fan of testing so much because today you test tomorrow you can become negative or today you sorry i put it other way around i'm sorry uh, it's other way around today you are negative tomorrow you may become positive so how do you know unless you test yourself every day how many people in a population are positive unless you lock down the people test everybody and then that numbers will give me a lot of value but when you move into the community every day when you encounter so many people so many situations uh, with the homites with surfaces we are likely to get back the infection back into us so look at this graph the beautiful graph this blue line shows the viral stay in the body this is how long up to 28 days it stays it starts from zero it goes on increasing in its concentration the number of viruses detectable is quite high and slowly it dies down whereas antibody testing the by serology it comes in late and nowadays it is also a lot of doubtful that how long it will stay is become a big question because a lot of patients are there is a relapse so we do not know how long this antibody stay so rt pcr based virion testing is the golden rule at this point in time so but still testing is only for people who have symptoms and say okay you got this symptom then that's why the number what you're seeing like 33000 people infected well only about 6 lakhs people have got tested 6 and a half lakh people have got tested in a population of 1.3 billion in india so that is a uh, it's just a sample it doesn't really we have to extrapolate right to extrapolate we have challenges with us as india is the diversity that's a challenge so some of the facts you need to look at from the government of india website are people say the weather has an impact mm -mm, not necessarily okay then uh, it transmits by through a mosquito or through pets no none of these things are going to happen and don't think having a hot water bath or you know having just a spray over you is going to protect you it is going to kill what is external but not what is inside your body right garlic these are all healthy things you can have them but i do, there is no evidence to say that they are going to protect you all right and somebody said uh, one of the leaders saying that you'll put uv light go under the sun put i mean or you know under the uv light uh, use uh, uh, your uh, horox and things like that this are all no signs in that one and remember antibiotics do not kill the viruses some of the myths are indian system is immune system is better and uh, eating non vegetarian is dangerous no it is not dangerous uh, the virus was manufactured in the lab no there is no proof for it chinese food is unsafe to eat wrong no not necessarily any food is unsafe if you buy it from outside you make it at home everything is safe because you do not know in the transmission where something has happened there was a case of a pizza delivery guy in delhi right so getting of course this is there is a some one uh, uh, aberration was this uh, mysore event where in julian case where we have the connection is with the shipment so i'm not sure how much to believe in this but of course generally it doesn't cause anything which comes from china is going to cause a disease now so now i'm going to pose this question where are you individually each one of us 
we have got our own imagination. I am this. I am Manish. Right? This is my body. This is how big I am. This is what I am. I say, where am I? I am here. But how much of I am I inside me? It's like the me and me question. Okay. So don't get me into that category. But I will show you a picture here. Look at this picture. Now, this is a diagram of a human body. And on the right side, you will see the sizes of the human cells. They are quite big cells, okay? Compared to the bacteria, which is just like a dot here on the left corner of this larger picture. It's a dot where the other cells are so huge. So you're going to put by number, the number of bacteria are more than 70, not bacteria, the microorganisms in the body are more than 70% of our body comprises of microorganisms by number. By size, we are big. <coughs> but the number of cells of human body comparatively is only about 20%, 20, 20, 20, 25% is all we are on the body. So what I'm trying to draw the point, why I put this slide is when you start sanitizing, let us be very mindful of our sanitization. Let us not kill all our microbes, eat good you know, vegetables, because we do get uh, microorganisms from the vegetables what we eat. Excellent environment, breathe in, you know, don't put a mask and live in your life. Breathe the normal air outside. When you're going outside, wear a mask, but when you're living at home, inhale the organisms. They are all everywhere. They're everywhere. That was the beauty why I took up microbiology when I was, when I was in school is because there is a world right in front of my eyes, which I cannot see with, with my naked eyes, right? So this is the world which we have in us. For many of you, it could be a revelation for some it's like, okay, I know about it, right? So this is how much of microorganisms we have and let us protect them. Because when you start putting too much of restriction, sanitization, sterile systems, the bacteria starts becoming resistant. And then we have problem with antimicrobial resistance, which is much of a headache for people. So let us not push ourselves to do things which are going to be harmful for the longer time. Our senior citizens are going to be more, uh, you know, volatile to get infected to these kind of multi-drug resistant infections, all right? So please be cautious because there is a constant interaction between the earth, the air, right? So here it's one health talks about the veterinary science, the human science and the plant science. All of us put together, there is a constant sharing. This is how the mutations also happen. There is a transmission of bugs from us to the animals, to the plants and vice versa. And nothing is going to kill us that much unless our body gets little time to adjust and build its immunity. And they also do the same thing. Everybody wants to live, including the microorganisms, it has come to survive, not to go away, right? So we need to focus on building a good immune system, not over good, because excessive immunity is going to work against our body, against allergies will start. So have a good balanced life, everything in balance. So the last slide, a uh, couple of slides, when and how will the pandemic end? This is the golden question and a million dollar question. Nobody can confirm it. When, nobody knows at this point in time. We predict, the predictions is based on the projection, unless we continue social control measures by time and new antiviral medications come in or a vaccine comes in, we are solely dependent upon herd immunity and social distancing as a means of controlling the disease. Now, this is the statistics of our country. We have how many? Quite a number of ICU beds spread across the country and the ventilators available, right? But they are all concentrated, concentrated in a very few states only. So that is also, it's very unevenly distributed facilities we have. So we need to have proper, uh, you know, social distancing post lockdown, right? So we need to self-isolate, be responsible citizens. That is what Sweden is doing. They say people's individual responsibilities. So we as Indians, as nationals, we need to take our responsibilities to not to you know, expose ourselves to undue signs and say, okay, nothing's going to happen to me. I'm going to walk in. Let's not do Let us maintain social distance to till we understand how we can stop this. There is a, this is, this is available by the principal sec, uh, scientific advisor on how to prepare a mask. And then moreover, wearing the mask is one thing. Removing the mask is very important. Do not touch the front or any other surface of the mask, even during wearing it. And when you remove the mask, it should directly go into alcohol-based sanitizer or soap and water or directly into a solution of boiling water. Don't keep it in a pocket and again wear it. And when talking, I see many of them below the nose or to the, they're wearing the mask to their throat and then again pull it up. If the virus is attached to the outer surface, you're touching with your hand and later on without your knowledge, you're touching your eyes, right? So you're self-inoculating. So let us be very mindful when you, otherwise don't wear a mask. 
at least you'll come and wash your face. Wearing a mask and concentrating them here and applying to yourself is not a good idea. So let us use our Indian style of namaskara. And we'll come to the end of the presentation. And I'll be glad to take any questions if you have uh, through the chat. I'll read up. Thank you. Can blood dialysis? Okay. Dialysis, laser, and UV radiation can be used to reduce the virus. See, viruses are not free flowing. They are not freely floating kind of organisms, right? They are in the cells. So how do you clean it when you're dialyzing it? So but dialysis is not going to take away the virus. It's not like a cleaning agent, dialysis. Irradiation, I mean, you don't get irradiated. Please don't do that. It is not going to kill the virus. What is inside the body? That's one of the questions calling, can irradiation be used? Lockdown is just a pause. Yes, lockdown, I, I showed you the graph, right? The flattening of the curve. Lockdown is, is required to first assess what we have, what kind of capacities we have got to manage the disease. And then we also have the time to organize ourselves and start treating the patients who are critical. So it is definitely only a pause at this time, but that is going to help us in controlling the spread of the disease uh, widely and have more casualties. Yes, plasma. how about the plasma treatment being talked about? That's a question. Yeah, is the, the convalescent plasma, you know, uh, ICMR also recommends 200 ml uh, per individual for the treatment, and that is acceptable because they have the antibodies in them which can be used for critical cases to kill the viruses. How are immune system, another question, how our immune system is responding to this virus? Well, if you see, uh, there's a lot of talk on the television about the um, asymptomatic carrier screening, right? Uh, how will you know who's asymptomatic? Are you asymptomatic? How do you know unless you have symptoms? Uh, you have 1.3 billion population, can we all go and get tested ourselves? No. So that means there are many of them who have been asymptomatic in our country who have carried the virus and have eradicated the virus from that already. So there is a very good response which not only in India, all over the world, there is very good response in uh, from the immune system against this virus. But the patients who have got this comorbidities, other underlying conditions, maybe cancer or any of those conditions, those are the patients who have very less immune response. So they become, they succumb to these infections in a very serious manner. How Virus main the another question, how virus maintains to survive on metal for so long? Okay, I told you the diagram, right? It has got a protein capsid uh, and then there's a nuclear material inside that. So it doesn't have any living system inside it. It doesn't have, a, it is called, we call it inanimate. It's almost like it's a living entity is what we call them. It lives or doesn't live. So it can, un, unless there is a, a, an UV light or any chemical interference did, uh, which can disinfected, which, which can break the protein, the virus doesn't die. It just stays there on the table for a very long time. It say, uh, the, uh, the record says nine days on surfaces for uh, this COVID-2, I mean, uh, SARS-CoV-2. How to handle groceries and vegetables we buy and bring home? How to process them before use? I, like, you know, how you used to do it? Normally you bring vegetables and you wash even otherwise, with or without uh, COVID-19, you are going to wash the vegetables. Here, I would recommend, I mean, at least that's what I'm trying to do at home as well is use uh, detergent uh, to wash the bigger ones. But when you're cooking it, don't have to worry. You take them, you cut them, put them for cooking, and then wash your hands. You're done. You don't have to wash everything with the detergent at all. <clears throat> Only the solids which you can wash, the packets and all you can handle with uh, soap because you do not know who all have carried it along the way. 
and even then if there is a long duration between these two virus would have died by now. and how much somebody is intentionally spitting on it or applying smearing on it you know an infected person that is sabotage that is criminal activity if they have done to protect yourself wash it with soap water the packets and your hands so with soap water after handling the vegetables if you're cooking them is it possible that the patient who is discharged or cured will again get infected yeah we have been reading about it right there is a relapse so that is the reason in that graph i showed antibody testing has become a little difficult for us to decide because uh, we do not know uh, whether it is long lived or not it is an ongoing pandemic at this point in time within 45 days a person has got reinfected which is scary but not everybody would uh, get into that uh, category most of them would not because the if you look at the sars the previous sars epidemic it was about uh, two years two two years some days was what the number they had put in until long until when the igg antibodies were seen in the sense protection was there so here we do not know yet at this point we see there are relapse happening so they can they are likely to get reinfected but the intensity may not be as uh, severe is what i believe is china really successful in reducing covid if yes how did they do it that was the first country i think which put the country under 100% lockdown because they studied they built hospitals they started treating their patients the other stories i don't want to comment on it but they did uh, through social distancing through control through lockdown they controlled the spread of the virus on a scale of 1 to 10 how much you rate the performance of india in tackling covid i don't want to be controversial here right uh, as a scientist i would answer this question uh, see uh, when you have uh, the way the advisors even fauci for that matter when you look at for trump there is a differences right the way the politicians think and the scientists think is very different but in our country our uh, prime minister has got a scientific panel and even karnataka state we have got a scientific panel they decide and they recommend and they recommend based on published literature and their limited experience in handling this case because we have only limited time we have spent on that not that uh, they have limited experience by themselves but in handling covid they have got very limited experience and with limited data available so with this scenario what we are seeing medically we are we are handling well there are enough ppes and looking at the number of cases you know 33000 right a number of ventilators we have is nearly 50000 ventilators we have in our country and number of icu beds are so many 90000 plus icu beds we have in our country but the number of cases which have gone to the hospital and tested positive are not so many right so that way if you see we are we have done a good job uh, now further lockdown well that has to be debated and thought about maybe they have different strategies what type of drugs are effectively kill the viral covid what are their general mechanism I, i i don't want to go into that one right now because it is very complex now it's it's science and anyone who has got this i have my email address there please uh, send me an email i'll uh, explain to you separately that one it's going to take about quite a while but that's a good question scientific question how to clean n95 mask after use same way wash it in detergent or an ipa i showed the slide right uh, exactly the same mechanism for cleaning them can you elaborate on covid mutations people say 10 variants okay good question uh it's not 10 some say initially they said 3 then they said 30 now they say 10 it doesn't matter because when would the virus mutate right now it is having a gala time the virus it is going on infecting and enjoying why should it mutate it will not mutate that easily these minor mutations are only aberrations they are not good. they are not going to stand and then increase in numbers they are not going to it's nothing to be alarmed but there are is natural to have this kind of mutations constantly in a, every living system there are constant mutations happening these are also those kind of mutations and nothing to cause an alarm at this point if there's relapse is there any time period within which the person might be reinfected So what we have seen so far is it's taken nearly 45 days before when the person has got reinfected so that's what we have right now we think around 45 days for reinfection but this is a very very look at the percentage i showed you a, a graph a table of the pop, indian population 
look at the number of people we are, and number of people who have died, and number of people who have gone to the hospital with COVID symptoms. It's totally negligible, which means it, the social distancing and the way we're handling the disease is quite good. There was a lot of encouragement, pressure in our institution to write the proposals on repurposing of the drugs. Okay, this is a comment from one of the uh, faculty. Well, of course, people the, the repurposing the drugs. Of course, people are talking of repurposing. Now, to repurpose a drug in an academia, uh, I won't venture into it because what would happen is there are already pharma companies, the government, and the whole system is investing so much time and money into getting this pandemic out of the system, right? So, as an academia, getting into a repurposing drug model is a challenge. It's going to take a lot of time uh, because starting we, we are starting from the POC level here. If you're repurposing known drugs, everything the big pharma have taken up the big fish. But what I would recommend is focusing on the sequel of the disease, what it's going to cause you after some time, right? That is what we may have to focus on. Uh, now there is a lung problem, right? There is going to be fibrosis and there's going to be, you know, renal problems. So many issues are going to come. How do we manage it in the long term? That is the area of research where we should focus more because there are enough players already into directly tackling the virus. Question, why there is a lot of variation in the recovery rate in different states of India, Kerala is doing much better. Again, it is the policies and systems. Uh, if you see how, uh, how much of uh, each state is willing to take the risk, because it is always a risk, and anybody can blame for whatever action. Now, somebody asked, did we handle it rightly, uh, the COVID-19 as a country? One can argue for it or against it, right? So, because when you're treading into an unknown terrain, this virus is very unknown to us. One has to be very mindful in criticizing or uh, saying anything negative about any other state. Every state is doing a good job, and every state is trying to balance between economy versus in you know, healthcare systems. Both are being balanced. So uh, there is going to be variation depending upon the people, the practices. Look at countries as well. Sweden, they don't have lockdown, but they're social distancing, and there's a personal responsibility. I'm going to be responsible. That's it they do. So some places we have to hit the pol police have to take you know lottery charge people, which is not necessary if you understand then you become responsible. So the more people become responsible, you automatically start contributing to us, uh, reducing the spread of the disease. I had a liver disease two months ago, but now it has been cured. Should I take more awareness to prevent COVID? Yes, of course. And that means you have some underlying condition, you, you need to take extra precautions. See, let the youngsters who come in contact with you, let them sanitize themselves every time they come to you. Because this interactions is what is going to cause, uh, you know, spread of the disease between uh, the youngsters and the senior citizens. In, in some countries, they have isolated senior citizens in the particular colonies as a culture itself, as a country culture, and they are managing very well. But in India, we live in the same house, same families. So it is a voluntarily conscious decision you have to make to isolate yourself within the family till there is a mechanism to get a vaccine and you know, help people to recover or handle the disease. Will you please elaborate your quote, microbes always have the last word. <laughs> well, that's just uh, a phrase. Because this is what uh, Louis Pasteur said, not me, myself. And wh why he said is the way microbes can mutate. And I always say this, I'm a, I'm, a, uh, I'm a passionate microbiologist, right? Always speak for the microbes more than any other uh, life form. Because uh, the way they think as a colony, when they form and establish a disease in an individual, he's, it's, it's a different level altogether. So how much ever we try to do, you saw the number of uh, microorganisms in our body compared to the number of cells, and yet they are not harming us. They are living in us, millions are there, trillions of microbes are on our body, inside our body, everywhere. And even they are there during the uh, birth, right? They are the first other organism which enter the body but they are very intelligent. They are not here to cause harm. The very small percentage of microbes are dangerous. Most of them are favorable. They're very healthy ones. So there is a, a symbiotic relationship between existing between man and uh, microbes, but he said it as a statement, Louis Pasteur. Okay, 
Washing with Dettol or Savlon is sufficient or we need to wash with soap and water only. I would recommend soap uh, over Savlon. Soap water is the best. Surgical mask and gloves are safe or the cotton mask and gloves are safe. Surgical mask and gloves were used. How many hours? Oh, okay. See, surgical masks are for, you know, let's not use surgical masks because there's shortage of supply for the clinicians and healthcare workers. So we need to spare them for them. That's the reason we talked about cloth mask because unless the difference is surgical masks or N95 are used by people who are in close contact with the deceased people or they themselves have the disease because they're non porous. It's one way the air goes in. Nothing comes from in, outside to inside and nothing goes from inside to outside. But cloth mask, you can breathe in and out, but you are in a mask. It, it reduces the percentage of uh, your chances rather it is not going to cut control, cut it off 100%. N95 is 95%. <coughs> Surgical is much lesser. Cloth is significantly lesser. Is there any chance that uh, virus might be mutated while being transmitted from one to another? Yeah. Yes, this is a, this is a mutated virus, SARS-CoV-2. Is coronavirus airborne? Not by itself, but it needs a carrier, which are your droplets. I showed you that image, right? When a person sneezes, how the, air, the particles rush and how it uh, the people walking behind can get it. So it needs a medium to transmit, unlike uh, uh, some uh, organisms which can go by air. This doesn't go by air. Last question, okay? What are the chances of recovery in case it does relapse? Almost equal chances, because it depends upon the intensity of the disease, right? The more intense the disease, the more uh, the severe the disease, the more the complications. If the disease was, assume you had initially a mild form of the disease, and you have antibodies, it relapses. Again, it could be mild or it could go, it, you cannot predict it, whether it will become serious or not. So the uh, chances of its uh, uh, recovery depends upon the severity the disease will take a person into. Can we generalize the conditions for mutations? We cannot because it's a uh, lot of epigenetics come into picture here, you know, in the sense of the environmental factors, the threat, the virus, all these things play a role in you know bringing that uh, mutations into the virus. Whether it transmits through rainwater, no. I mean, uh, I do not know at this point in time, but uh, I I don't expect it to go by rainwater. No. All right. Thank you very much, everybody, for being part of the program. See you next time. Bye-bye.